Yeah, because I mean, obviously, if you've got, if you have more wealth, then a negative market outcome would still leave you with enough to sustain, right? So it's, I was, and this kind of segues nicely into what I what I think is also super critical, and that is the the constraints on the ability for safe choices to deliver the required returns, right? I mean, we certainly just went through a long period where the returns on annuities or, you know, the returns on safety first type approaches were so low that it made it, it made it a much harder decision to lock in at such low rates, right? Um, so, you know, how do you find that people balance off this preference for safety first um, and optionality against the constraint of, you know, we're just in a super low, low return environment for safe investments and perhaps for all investments. So it seems to me that, that there'd be a tension there. Yeah, well, ultimately, like, there's three basic ways you could fund retirement. First would be you could just use bonds as a baseline and that's not going to support a lot of spending. So if you want to spend more than bonds, then you've got these two options. You've got the, the risk premium idea, the probability-based rely on the markets, diversified portfolio. And then you've got the risk pooling, the longevity pooling idea of uh, an annuity can provide a higher spending level that relative to bonds that can actually be quite competitive with the stock market. And so it's not that either one's necessarily superior to the other. It's and it's not that the annuity or, or safety first approach doesn't use any investments, but it's it's a different way of a viable strategy of, of building a floor in a manner that these different approaches can be competitive with each other. It, it's interesting too that it does, as best as we can tell, seem like these retirement styles are personality characteristics that aren't just responding to changes in the market and so forth. We just recently, with a, a large asset manager, conducted the, the RISA study again. And we added another interesting question there that was really neat to see. The question was just asking people, what do you expect the stock market to do over the next 10 years? With a range of answers from less than 0% average returns to more than 15% average returns. Now, someone might think, total returns as a style would be correlated with a higher stock market return expectation. We did not see that at all. There's no relation. If you could be income protection and still think the stock market's going to do 15%, you could be total returns and think the stock market's going to do 0%. It's, there's not a correlation between retirement styles and what people believe the markets will do in the future. So I, I think that it's just, it's, it's a personality characteristic. It's just how somebody's wired about how they think about the world. And it's not going to necessarily fluctuate based on what's been happening in the markets or based on where interest rates are and so forth. What about FOMO? <laughs> like what if I mean, you've got somebody who prefers safety first and they lock in, is there ever a fear that their friend group that has a different personality and didn't lock in and therefore takes advantage of, of, the optionality and potential upside in, in a more risky portfolio may just leave them behind. I mean, I know that like this is relative status is a, an extremely powerful mm -hmm. motivator in many dimensions of life. So I just wonder whether that enters into people's decision making. I suppose that could be an issue, but part of it too is someone who's safety first might not necessarily have been using a high stock allocation as the alternative. And actually by building that protected income floor, then they may feel more comfortable. I usually talk about annuities treating them as an alternative to bonds, not as an alternative to stocks. Mm. So an income protection approach doesn't necessarily require less stock holdings than a total return approach. And if that sort of thinking resonates, uh, you're not necessarily getting into the scenario where you have less upside exposure or less market return exposure when you use a uh, income protection or a, a safety first type of strategy. Right. So how about a, a hybrid, a hybrid approach that might take these building blocks and say, I want to take a two thirds approach where I'm guaranteeing minimum amount that will cover my expenses, but that I, I want to retain some optionality and, 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 you know, address some of the FOMO or some of the uh, upside that I want to 
be able to capture, uh, you know, if we are coming into a, a equity bull market, which in the in, in, at present day doesn't seem like the most, uh, uh, you know, a high probability type of event. But is that something that you've come across? Do you do you, do you see that happening a lot, or do people tend to stick to one approach or the other? Well, to be clear, like the income protection approach is not annuities only. It's first get the protected lifetime income floor and then invest on top of that. So to some extent, it is the hybrid approach. It would be something like total returns is only using investments, uh, but the others are well, income protection or risk graph would be use the floor, and that, but that's not going to take the entire asset base. No one should be putting all their assets, locking that up into some annuity structure. So then you, you also have the investment piece on top of that.